Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Mr. Keller, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. I invited you back here just to be able to chat with you again about the JFK assassination, but specifically areas we have not really spent a whole episode on the past two times you were on, which is the Tippett killing, which I think is a confusion for us all. Now, I know in your book, you say that Oswald did kill Tippett. I'm interested if your thoughts have changed, because I think the last time we talked, you mentioned some things that you had a little bit of a different opinion on when it came to the mafia's involvement compared to the CIA's involvement on things. Could you give me a breakdown of the Tippett killing or what you discovered originally, like how you started looking into it? OK, well, actually, basically, the Tippett, Tippett killing is is a major chapter in the book that I wrote. He was expendable. And. One of the things I think you have to keep in mind about the Tippett killing, and I hate to quote this gentleman, but uh, his quote is quite apt in this particular situation, Vincent Bugliosi. Bugliosi said, so we have to infer from what happened, from what little we do know. So we're extrapolating on a lot of stuff. There's a lot of details here in this Tippett killing, there's a lot of information that we're missing, and we'll point that out as we go along today. But when you talk about the process of extrapolating or guessing from the information that you have, what you're attempting to do is to build a hypothesis that explains what took place. And of course, like any hypothesis, it has to be consistently, constantly tested. But let me give you a couple of quick examples here. The time frame when Tippett was killed. When was he actually killed? Well, if you listen to Helen Markham, who was the witness on the scene who saw the Tippett shooting, and uh, T.F. Boley, who happened to be picking his daughter up in the area and came upon the scene right after Tippett was shot, the killing took place at 1.10 p.m. Now, these two folks were at the scene. Both of them saying 1.10 p.m. But if you look at the Warren Commission, which is extrapolating from the evidence, guessing, they say 1.16. If you look at Dale Myers, and Dale Myers wrote a pretty good book on this. I think his conclusions are wrong. But Myers had the time at 1.14.30. Vincent Bugliosi put the time at 1.12. The last three are guessing. They're extrapolating from the data. And there's another example of this as well. The problem with Oswald leaving the rooming house at North Beckley at approximately 103 and being a mile away at approximately 110 at the time of the shooting. That becomes a problem as well. And when you go back and you take a look at the estimates of when Oswald left that rooming house. So if you go to the FBI who tracked all his steps, they estimate that he got to the rooming house at 1 o'clock or 101.30. The Warren Commission, in a low estimate of the timing, which needs to be adjusted to take into um, account another trip that was done by the cab driver, Whaley, uh, along with the uh, Dallas uh, police, puts the time at approximately 1 to 101. If you uh, adjust the longer period for the Warren Commission, they've got him arriving at the rooming house at 1259. But when that total is adjusted, it's 103. So you got all these different estimates based upon guesses. OK, so we always need to keep that in mind. That's what Bugliosi is ma making the point. We have to infer what happened from what little we know. That's a big problem with this Tippett killing. But for me, the reason that I think largely that Oswald killed Tippett is the number of witnesses who stated categorically that they saw either Oswald carry out the shooting or saw him directly at the scene. So let's take a run through some of those witnesses. Of course, the first one is Helen Markham, who was on the way to work at the Eat Well restaurant in Dallas, where she worked as a waitress. She 
put the timing at approximately 110. And she was going to work, something she does every day of the week. So you would think that she would have a pretty good approximation of the timing as to when she was at the corner, headed to the bus stop, and so on. Because she did it every day. Now, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that Helen Markham was soundly criticized for her behavior during the testimony at the Warren Commission, that she was, you know, very upset and almost hysterical. But I don't find that to be unusual. Here's a woman who witnessed the violent murder of a police officer in the street about a half a block away from where she was standing. She went over and saw his dead body at the location that had occurred by the police car. I mean, this, this would traumatize a great many people so that when she is reforced to relive this experience testifying before the Warren Commission, I'm not at all surprised that she became overly excited and probably uh, close to being hysterical. That doesn't surprise me at all. And I don't think most psychologists uh, or psychiatrists would differ from that particular opinion. I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but I think that kind of behavior, reliving that kind of incident, would not be unusual. So I think she was right there. She saw Oswald. He ran towards her, looked directly at her, which was a very frightening experience for her. And so there's your number one witness. The second one is Jack Ray Tatum, who was driving by. He was found years later by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And as he was driving by, he saw Tippett stop Oswald. And he, one of the things that he said in his testimony was he was very surprised that the police officer stopped Oswald because Oswald was not doing anything that would trigger a stop. You have to keep this in mind, by the way. All right. And um, Tatum said that um, he heard three gunshots. He stopped the car and looked back. And then he saw Tippett on the ground and he saw Oswald, who he identified as Oswald, shoot Tippett in the head and uh, then proceed to leave the uh, location. We have the uh, cab driver, William Scoggins, who had dropped the fare not too far away and drove over to a um, restaurant type bar to pick up lunch. And this was on Patton. He was parked on Patton Street. And he decided to eat his lunch in the car because the bar was so crowded with people because of the coverage of the assassination, he decided just to eat it in the car. Where he was sitting, he had a complete view down the street to where Tippett made the stop and would have been able to see the interaction between Tippett and uh, Oswald. And he did see the officer stop him, but he went back to eating his lunch and didn't pay any attention. And when he heard the shots, he got out of the car and was trying to hide when all of a sudden Oswald was on top of him with a gun in his hand. He clearly identified Oswald as the individual running from the scene. Then there were two people who lived in an apartment house right by the tip of shooting, Barbara and Virginia Davis. They were sisters-in-laws. And when they heard the shots, they ran outside to see what happened. Who did they see with a gun in his hand standing in the street? Lee Harvey Oswald. Both of them identified Oswald as the killer of Tippett, as being at the scene. Okay. In the lineups or and just description? They, they identified him in a lineup. Because the lineups, we, I think... everybody here except for Jack Ray Tatum identified Oswald in a lineup. Because weren't those lineups rigged, though? Those lineups, they had cops in the lineups, and he was like the only one with a black eye as well, too. Wouldn't that just be? You could probably, as a defense attorney, you would have probably made a claim about those lineups. But you still have all of these people who were directly there identifying Oswald, regardless of who was in the lineup. They picked Oswald out. But why did why did why did Helen Markham, like the star witness, change her testimony from the first time she stated to the second time? She I mean, didn't really she... change the testimony. If you read the testimony all the way through, 
she talked about having her hands over her face screaming and she didn't really couldn't get a clear vision. And then she somehow was able to just pull Oswald out of the lineup and said, that's the guy who I identified. Well, when you when you look at her testimony before the Warren Commission, she clearly states it was Oswald. You got to read on. You got to read the whole testimony. A lot of people don't go the full route. I don't mean you. But when you read her testimony, she clearly said it was Oswald. OK, I mean, after some coaxing and she didn't seem to quite understand the questions. But this was not a well-educated person. She went through grammar school and here she is before a presidential commission. She doesn't have an attorney with her. She has nobody helping her out. And she's totally upset about, you know, having to revisit this traumatizing event. So I'm I, I'm willing to cut her some slack because of th that fact. But Davis also found two cartridge shells at the scene, which she turned over to the police. Now you've got Ted Calloway, the used car manager. He runs up to Patton Street. As he's going up there, an individual with a gun in his hand runs in the opposite direction from him, and he clearly identified Oswald in a lineup. Okay, so you got another witness. You got so far, you got six witnesses. Then you had Sam Ginyard, who also worked at the car lot with um, Callaway, and Ginyard also ran up the Patton Street. He also saw the individual running away and identified Oswald. And then, now that's seven witnesses. Then you had an additional four witnesses who saw him on Jefferson Boulevard, Harold Russell, B.M. Patterson, Robert Brock, and Mary Brock. All those witnesses identified Oswald as the person they saw with a gun in his hand running on Jefferson Boulevard. They identified him from photographs. Now. You might want to question that. You might want to challenge that in the court of law, but they still identified Oswald. You got 11 witnesses here. Excuse me, make sure I get the right count. Yeah, you got 11 witnesses here, at least, all of whom identified Oswald, and two who were directly at the scene and saw the shooting, Jack Ray Tatum and Helen Markham. And nobody, if you, if you want to attack... Um, you know, Markham's testimony, nobody has impeached Jack Ray Tatum. So basically, you've got a lot of eyewitness testimony that Oswald killed Tippett. Why did, Tip, why did Tippett stop Oswald? Well, let's go to the next part of this. This is where I think the problem comes up. The stop. OK, let me there are five questions you really need to answer in this Tippett murder to construct any kind of working hypothesis. OK, and that's all we're ever going to be able to do. One is why was Tippett's behavior so odd before his encounter with Oswald? Number two, did Tippett go to Oswald's rooming house? Number three, why did Tippett stop Oswald? Number four, and this is the one that I have to tell you when I was going through this for two weeks, morning, noon, and night, I kept thinking about this. Tippett was driving a 1963 Ford Galaxy patrol car. That car had a passenger side window and a vent window. When they found Tippett's car, the passenger side door was locked. The window was up and the vent window was open. He conducted his interview with Oswald through the vent window. We're gonna come back to this in a minute. That's, that's odd. The fourth question we need to answer is just what I said. Why did he speak to him through the vent window? And five, why did Oswald execute Tippett? So let's start with number one. If you go back and you review what Tippett was doing before 
his encounter with Oswald. We have to ask ourselves the question, why in the world would a Dallas police officer be cruising through a residential neighborhood looking for the president's assassin? What in the world would make him think a presidential assassin? This is what the Warren Commission told us he was doing, looking for a presidential assassin. What would he be doing in a, in a residential neighborhood? I don't know if you ever went to the shooting scene. I was there several times. This is clearly a residential neighborhood. You know, you might be checking uh, cab stands. You might be checking bus depots. You might be checking a railroad station. You might be checking the airport. But you're going to drive around in a residential neighborhood looking for a presidential assassin? Doesn't fit. Okay. He is seen earlier to that at the Glocko gas station on Zhang Boulevard, which is when you go over the Houston Viaduct, it turns into Zhang Boulevard. Oswald, when he either took the bus or took the cab, would have come directly over the Houston Viaduct onto Zhang Boulevard, right past where Tippett was sitting. Happens to be sitting right at that very spot, out of his patrol area to begin with. He is seen there by two individuals, Al Vokeland and his wife Lou, both of whom personally knew Tippett, waved to him, you know, waves hello and so on. It was definitely Tippett. They said he was parked there between 1245 and 12. 50. Tom Mullins, Emmett Hollingshead, and Jay Shorty Lewis, who worked at that station, and all three of them knew Tippett, said he was parked there between 1245 and 1 p.m. All three of them knew this guy personally. They said he was there for about 10 minutes, and then all of a sudden, took off at a high rate of speed down Lancaster Boulevard, in the direction, by the way, of where Jack Ruby's apartment was. Okay, we'll get back to that a little bit later on. Tippett's position at the Glocko gas station was one mile from Oswald's rooming house at North Beckley. Could he have driven to Oswald's rooming house? Sure could have. He was right there. We're going to come back to this in a moment as well. And another period of time right after that, uh, Tippett entered the top 10 record store where he kind of burst into the store, went right up, took up, picked up the phone, made a phone call, stayed on for a limited period of time while the phone was ringing, hung up, kind of gruffly left got back in the car and took off at a high rate of speed. James Andrews, an insurance company executive, was driving near Austin's Barbecue on 10th Street when a police car cut in front of him, forced him to stop. A police officer got out of the car, ran over, looked in the back of his car, got back in his car and took off, never said a word. Who was the officer? J.D. Tippett. The guy saw his badge and saw his name clearly on there, Tippett. Other witnesses that day said they saw Tippett cruising around, looking up and down side streets. So his behavior was extremely odd. And I talked to police officers from Los Angeles and from New York. These are all patrol officers. Every one of them said this kind of behavior, what he was doing, in the, and in the fashion that he was doing it, was re really extremely odd and to some degree uh, very unusual. And so we have to consider that when we think about Tippett's role in what was going on that particular day. Did he go to... Um, the rooming house where Earlene Roberts 
claimed that Oswald returned at approximately 1 o'clock and left at approximately 103. And she said during that period of time, a Dallas police car drove up in front of the house, blew the horn twice. When she went to the window, the police car left. Now, a lot of people have attacked Earlene Roberts, particularly Dale Myers in his book, which was which is very well done, a good comp compendium of the evidence. Um, you know, it's the, the old tactic of if you can't disprove that she saw the police car attack the witness. And that's what uh, Myers does in his book. But Roberts had glaucoma. So her vision was not that great. She said there were two police officers in the car. Well, of course, Tippett was by himself. But what was interesting was that in the back right-hand side passenger window, his Eisenhower police jacket, which had just come from the cleaners, was hanging there. It is possible she saw that uniform jacket and mistaken as a police officer. That's possible. Okay. But she clearly stated the police car drove up. And then when she went to the window, it took off. She said when Oswald left, he stood outside for a little bit, hesitating about what to do, as if he was waiting for a ride, which never came. And then whatever he did from that particular point on is a mystery to this day. Okay. But the question is, did that police car driven by Tippett's show up at the rooming house? Now, there was an officer that did go. There was an officer that was with Tippett in another squad vehicle that was that went to a call when the Tippett shooting happened. Um, but that squad number, that guy's squad car was not the same one. I forgot what the number was of the car that pulled out in front of Oswald's um, place. But when we last talked, I actually dug through some of the documents and there were, I think, at least three cars that were three or four that were in the area that could have potential to be one of those cars that honked at Oswald's um, well, based on I'm, the I'm gonna documents. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you to go to Warren Commission Exhibits, Volume 25, Commission Exhibit 2645, pages 606 to 615. Mm. I love it. I that's love it. The, that's the FBI report. The, the, the Warren Commission was so disturbed by what Earlene Roberts had to say that they ordered the FBI to check every Dallas police car in operation that day to find out if anyone could have driven by the rooming house. And the FBI went through all the cars, all the police officers, they're all listed in there, numerous police officers, numerous cars. There was a couple that were in the area, potentially, the FBI interviewed those officers. They said, we didn't go near the rooming house. So the FBI came up with nobody went to the rooming house. But there's one problem with this report. And I had to read this thing 10 times because I thought I was making a mistake. Was it that they took the cops at their word? There was no mention of Tippett's police car in that report. Ooh. He's not even mentioned. His car is not even covered. The FBI didn't even give any thought that it could be Tippett, apparently, or they left it out intentionally. I don't know what their what their intent was or what happened. Oswald's police, excuse me, Tippett's police car. Remember what I just told you at the Glocko gas station where he was at, 1250 to 1255 roughly. He was one mile from Oswald's rooming house. Now let me, I did a chart on this just to give you some examples. At 60 miles an hour, he could have been at that rooming house in one minute. At 45 miles an hour, it would have taken him from the gas station to Oswald's rooming house, one minute, 20 seconds. At 35 miles an hour, 
it would have taken them one minute, 43 seconds. At 30 miles an hour, it would have only taken two minutes. But we have to keep in mind one thing. Tippett was driving a police car. He didn't have to stop at red lights. He didn't have to stop at stop signs. And he could have driven over there at 70 miles an hour if he wanted to. So he could easily have been from that Glocko station to the rooming house within the time period that this all took place. And the FBI didn't even mention his car or his name in that investigation. What's the explanation for that? Okay, so we got a problem. So there is a there is a there is a a, a potential. And once again, we're guessing. We're extrapolating that he was at that rooming house. That Earlene Roberts was correct. That she saw a police car stop in front of the house, blow the horn twice, and then leave. As if somebody came over there to give Oswald a lift, a ride someplace, whatever the situation was. Okay, we'll come back to this in a moment. Then the next one is, why did Tippett stop Oswald? Well, we're never going to be able to fully answer that because Tippett is dead and Oswald is dead. And there was nobody else at the direct scene to hear the questions that were asked. Now, what I think is this. This is my theory. I'm extrapolating. Okay. I think Tippett was approached by somebody to do a favor. And that favor was to pick up Oswald at that rooming house. Give him a ride somewhere. Was Tippett part of the assassination? Not at all. He was just a local cop doing somebody a favor. We'll get to who the potential people that he might be doing the favor for in a moment, okay? But I think that that's what may have been going on. Now, while he is driving out to pick Oswald up, somehow or other, he misses the connection. You know, he's at the Glocko gas station on Zhang Boulevard when Oswald would have gone by in the cab or in the bus had he stayed on the bus. That connection was missed if there was a connection supposed to take place there. So he goes to the rooming house. The woman comes to the window. He sees the woman at the window. He doesn't want to be seen, so he leaves. Now he's missed his opportunity to pick up Oswald. So what is he doing? Cruising the neighborhood, looking for Oswald later. That would explain his actions, driving up and down all these side streets in a residential area, allegedly looking for a presidential assassin. That would explain what he was doing. And so basically, he's, he's trying to accomplish this goal. And then when he can't find the person initially, he goes to the top 10 record store and tries to contact maybe whoever asked him to do the favor. But there's a problem here. As he's driving to carry out this favor, cops are street wise. They would never survive out in the street if they weren't sharp-witted about what's going on. He's listening to the police radio. What is he hearing on the police radio? President is shot in Dealey Plaza on the way to Parkland Hospital. By the time Tippett is reaching Oswald, the information may have already been out that Kennedy's dead. So what does the streetwise cop start to think? What the hell am I doing here? Am I going out here and getting involved in something I don't want to be involved in? So when he pulls up and he sees Oswald on the street and he stops him, which every police officer I said, I talked to said, was a dumb way to stop a, a potential criminal or gunman or assassin. And um, he pulls up next to him. He talks to him through the vent window. The car door is locked. The window's up. Oswald, who might be expecting a ride, can't reach in, can't open the door. He can't reach in through the open window to open the door. Tippett's got him locked out. And he conducts the interview through the vent window. 
Now, maybe he starts asking Oswald some, some questions because he's suspicious at this point. When he gets out of the car, Oswald is already backing up. You have to keep in mind one other thing here. About three minutes after the assassination, when Oswald is in the book depository, a Dallas police officer, Marion Baker, Baker, I think it was, runs into the book depository and has his gun stuck in Oswald's stomach within three minutes of the assassination. No more than 45 minutes after that assassination, another Dallas police officer is confronting Oswald on the street. When, when Tippett starts asking all these questions, Oswald backs up when he gets out of the car. As soon as Tippett gets out, he doesn't wait. He shoots Tippett three times. Tippett goes down on the ground. Oswald starts to run away, comes back and shoots him in the head. What Bob Blakey called the coup de grace, kind of like a gangland slaying. Not that the mafia is involved, but, you know, it was an execution. Okay. Now, you got to think about this vent window. Why would you conduct this kind of an interview through the vent window? Why didn't he get out of the car like any police officer would have gotten out of the car, be standing up and in a commanding position? The other thing is this. You have to go back and think about this for a minute. 1963, Dallas police officers and police officers across the country did not have the radio equipment they have today. So when they got out of the police car, they always left the windows in the police car open so they could hear the police radio when they were outside the car. What does Tippett have? The window closed up on the passenger side. They couldn't have heard anything. And so the key point simply is, the vent window is highly suspicious. And what it says to me is that he was realizing that he may have gotten himself into a situation he didn't want to be in. And he wants to ask some questions before carrying out the favor for Oswald. And when he does that, that was his death warrant because Oswald was going to kill him. Okay? So... When we think about the vent window, I think that's extremely important. And one of the things, even Dale Myers in his book clearly admits, Tippett spoke to him through the vent window. You got to think about that. That's important. Okay. Now, why did Oswald execute Tippett? Why did he go back? Does that sound like anything he would do? Turn around and go for a headshot? You mean Oswald? Yeah. That does not sound like any dysfunctional kid or whatever the Warren Commission painted him out to be or any information that's perceived of Oswald throughout this whole case. The turning around for the ex execution style thing does not seem like Oswald. Yeah, the Warren Commission didn't, didn't really um, focus a lot on it, but the House Select Committee on Assassinations did. And uh, basically, um, as I said, Bob Blakey... Uh, Called it a coup de grace. It was an execution. Have you spoken to him recently about it? Well, I think I think the the it raises the question that's been brought up that these two guys have a relationship before the assassination. Was there any way, shape, or form that they knew one another? Well, if you go back and and check the you know you got to go through the interesting thing is. The Warren Commission will tell you Tippett and Ruby, excuse me, Tippett and Oswald did not know one another. Okay. Now, the problem is when you go through the Warren Commission, you find all kinds of things in the Warren Commission report that contradict the conclusions of the Warren Commission. That's why it's great to read the whole report. You got to go through all 26 volumes. You got to read all the documents, every one of them. And so when you do, you find out that a couple of days before the assassination, 
Oswald and Tippett were eating in the same cafe a couple of blocks from Oswald's rooming house, the uh, Dobbs House Cafe. It's no longer there. And uh, I think it's a drugstore now. I went out there, checked it out, but it was gone. And this is like no more than two blocks from where Oswald was staying. The waitress, Mary Ann Dowling, saw Oswald in the restaurant, sitting on the other side of the counter was J.D. Tippett. Oswald was in there loudly complaining about his eggs in a very abusive manner, and Tippett was watching him. So obviously, there was some kind of recognition or contact prior to that stop on uh, Tent and Patton. No, I've heard that story, but do you believe that was Oswald, though? We know someone was using his name or saying that he was shooting targets at a firing range, saying this is what he was going to do to the president, trying to sell a rifle to get a car fixed. I mean, there's a lot of usage of Lee Harvey Oswald's name, which makes him seem like he's in multiple well, places they, at once. They clearly, they, they clearly stated it was Oswald. The witnesses clearly stated it was him, okay? And they were serving him breakfast. I mean, it wasn't some situation where people thought somebody came in and used a different name again i thought he was broke how is he affording breakfast you, the guy had no cash but had multiple wallets i mean can this, we explain those anomalies actually even it was multiple another wallet found at the uh, scene of the Jesus, temper killing i don't know i know i just i don't that's but that's the one they're showing on camera like look what we found we found this wallet with the aj heidel id where does that fit in? I, that's another. That's a whole other story. But the waitress, Mary Ann Dowling, was backed up by the other waitress who also saw the meeting in. And the uh, manager of the uh, Dobbs House Cafe, uh, let, me see, let me just quickly find, I had the information right here. Well, the manager that was there also, the night manager, forget his name at the moment, uh, Basically, he also said, oh, Dolores Harrison was the other manager, well, not the other manager, the other waitress who saw the two of them there. And a gentleman by the name of Douglas Sleek was the light night manager. One of the interesting things Leek said that was that Oswald ate there a number of times. And he also stated Jack Ruby ate there. And when Jack Ruby used to come in, he would pick up all the checks for Dallas police officers who might be eating in there. But you had this contact ahead of time. So in other words, there is this possibility that they knew one another. And that would be reason enough for Oswald to think, oh, I shot this guy, but is he dead? This guy knows who I am. He. Keep it in mind, if Tippett went to the rooming house, he had Oswald's address. So Oswald wanted to obliterate any connection between him and Tippett. So what does he do? Goes back and shoots him in the head. There's no doubt about it. He's dead. What so about I think that that's part of it as well. Could we bring up the possibility of doubles? I mean, you know the Bernard Hare's, Hare story, right? The testimony of Bernard Hare? Refresh me on that. At the Texas theater, this guy thought he saw the cops taking Oswald out back. And for like 30 something years, he thought this is how they arrested Oswald. But then the photos came out because the photos didn't come out immediately of Oswald being taken out. They came out later after the fact. And he saw those photos of Oswald being brought out the front. And he goes, well, I specifically saw in his testimony states that he saw Oswald being pulled out the back. And being arrested in the alleyway. So obviously someone is either look. I mean, there are two people arrested at the theater, too. A lot of people don't realize that. So there were similar looking people, whether it was accidental, if it was the style back then. But we also know the various accounts of people using Oswald's name, whether it was Lee Harvey or it was this. And that's why you have these multiple Oswald theories. What I'm saying is the one that I have come to know, the one that was actually based on Marina and based on Ruth Payne's testimonies and the DeMorne Shields testimonies, it's this Oswald with the execution shot just doesn't work for me. Well, you got two witnesses who saw it. 
Yeah, but what what well, are the conspiracy or the skeptics always say you can't trust a witness testimony and only unless it fits their points, right? You know, you know that that's all well and good, but at some point when you've got this number of people who put him at the scene, you know, you've got to say where there's smoke, there's fire. You know, you just got too many people who saw him there. And his pistol, while you could not determine you couldn't use any ballistics tests. The FBI was able to determine that all four cartridges came from his pistol. So, you know, and he's arrested with this gun in his possession. So how would you explain all of that? I mean, there's just too much evidence that he acted, that he was at this scene, that he was accosted or stopped by Tippett potentially for no reason. And the way the whole search was conducted, the interview was conducted, the whole thing is suspicious. And it looks to me as if Tippett was there to render some assistance and started to rethink what he was doing. Now, the other thing that, that always bothered me too is this. Who could have Ask Tippett for the favor. What guy could have done that? What individual? And, you know, the more you dig into this, the more interesting it becomes. Because I don't know if you, if the name Bertha Chink, Cheek rings a bell for you. She was a Dallas real estate broker. She knew Jack Ruby, knew him for years. One week before the assassination, she meets with Ruby. She claimed that Ruby wanted to get her to open another club. And she, because he wouldn't specify the location, she didn't want to get involved. But the Warren Commission was very suspicious. I and mean, they questioned her at length. And the interesting thing about Bertha Cheek was her sister was Earlene Roberts, the rooming house manager at Beckley, the Beckley Street address, okay, where Oswald was staying. So that gives Ruby a kind of an indirect contact to Oswald. He could have had information through Cheek about Oswald. That's possible, okay? So that's one connection. Ruby also knew Sergeant Calvin Owens. Owens was soup was uh, Tippett's supervisor for a number of years, and also knew Ruby for almost ten years. This is another indirect route to Oswald through Calvin Owens, through Bert the Cheek. And when you look at Ruby, and one of the things I say in my book. If the Kennedy assassination was the solar system, Jack Ruby was the son. He was at everything, and he knew everybody. Even if you come down to uh, Helen Markham, Ruby and his uh, roommate, George Senator, both ate at the Eat Well restaurant where Helen Markham worked as a uh, waitress. Probably knew her, okay? Ruby's apartment, this was astounding to me. If you go to the Tippett murder scene and then go to, to the scene, the location where Jack Ruby's apartment was uh, located, three-tenths of a mile away. Oswald's walking in that direction when he stopped by Tippett. Okay? Ruby is all over this. Tippett and Oswald and uh, Ruby all shopped at the ten, top 10 record store. All three of them were in there at various times. Ruby and Oswald shopped at the same local delicatessen in Oak Cliff. And so there are all these other connections. Although they're not direct, they offer the potential for meeting, for linkage of some type. And so I'm wondering, did Tippett 
was Tippett approached in some way, shape, or form by Ruby to aid or assist Lee Harvey Oswald in escaping from Dallas? Of course, you know that Redbird Airport, Airport was only a few miles away from where Tippett was killed. Well, do you believe that Ruby gave Oswald a gun? There's a couple I've witnesses. Not, I've never that seen any that. evidence. I've never seen any evidence to that. I mean, they had they had all the records of Oswald purchasing that pistol. Okay. Yeah, but didn't they have like an FBI agent at that post office? I forgot what his name is. At the post office? At the mail, at the post office where Oswald allegedly ordered this rifle. There was an FBI. Oh, uh, Harry in, Holmes? Yeah, the inspector? yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's some I issues with the delivery of that rifle, I can tell you that much. Yeah, I got to tell you, I've always had, I've always had, I was always bothered by Harry Holmes. I don't know. I never felt comfortable about his involvement. But to come back to the whole thing, the, 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 all I can basically say to you is, when you add the trying to answer these five questions, Tippett's behavior was very suspicious. The vent window thing is a problem. Okay. Why he made the stop is a problem. And of course, a lot of these things we're never going to really know, as I said in the beginning, because both Oswald and Tippett are dead. And we have no idea what they said to one another. We can only you know, guess as to what may have happened. Create a hypothesis. Then you have to see, you have to test it and see if it works. But I don't see any other explanation. I think one of the big problems here is if Tippett was at that rooming house, that says a lot. And I'm not sure that we can disprove what Earlene and Robert said by attacking her as a person, which is what Myers did. And um, the other thing that is very troubling here is the FBI report. Why was that car, why was Tippett and the car left out of that report? And now, I don't think we're going to get any answers now. I mean, I could be a sense of I think a lot of people might have discovered he was crooked and there was a way to keep his reputation intact. You mean Tippett? Yeah, Tippett. I think once the FBI probably started investigating into it, they probably came across some things that didn't make sense, much like you're coming across things that don't make sense about what he was up to. And they might have realized he might have been a little bit corrupt. And to save his reputation, they decided to create this image. Everyone needs a hero. You know what I mean? He became this well uh, cop that died in the line of duty, protecting his state, whatever you want to say. But it's on the the theater. When you look at the memoriam plaque, it's out in front of the theater. They talk about it be for a slain police officer. Um, this is where the killer of Officer J. D. Tippett, um, you know, was arrested. So it's like when you look at that. I mean, how much of was Tippett on the up and up, or was he really like? You know, just like every other Dallas cop, we start to learn to find out that somehow knew Jack Ruby or went ice skating with Jack Ruby or did some type of thing with Jack Ruby. Well, you know, I, I tell you, one of the interesting things for me, if you read Dale Myers' book with Malice, and I have to give Dale Myers a lot of credit because he really assembled a lot of evidence in this. He was very careful about it. Myers... I thought did an excellent book, but his conclusions are wrong. And part of the reason that his conclusions are wrong is exactly what you just said. He treated Tippett as a hero. He was this epitome of law enforcement, the good guy. And he's blinded by that conclusion, as is Vincent Bugliosi. You know, when you look at Buyosi, he had the same attitude about Tippett. Buyosi is a lifelong prosecutor, was a lifelong prosecutor. A lifelong liar. Police. Yeah. And so basically, if you take that view, Tippett's a hero, you miss all of the other 
nuances of his behavior that day. The odd behavior, the way he was driving around and acting, you know, where he was parked, how close to the rooming house he was, talking to him through the vent window, leaving the car window closed when he got out of the car. When police, as I said, always left the windows open so he could hear the police radio. Um, all of this is missed if you turn Tippett into a hero. Every police officer that I spoke to, and I spoke to police officers that were in Los Angeles and New York, all patrol officers, by the way, many of them with many years in the street, all of them said, this guy was doing something he shouldn't have been doing that day. He was up to something other than normal police business. And so um, I don't think he was this big hero. And I don't think he was a bad guy. I think he was just somebody who got caught up in doing a favor. Now, whether he was getting paid for that or not, that, that's a whole other story. But I think when he started to hear all the news on the radio, Kennedy shot in downtown Dallas. Maybe he's dead. I mean, this is all over the police radio. He's on the way to pick up Oswald. He starts to ask himself a question. What the hell am I doing? He starts asking some tough questions when he stops Oswald. Oswald's already triggered up because of the stop by Marion Baker earlier that day where you know, he sticks his gun in Oswald's stomach and he's ready to shoot if Tippett got out of the car, which he did. And so basically, Tippett handled it in a very bad fashion. And you know what was unusual was Tippett and a partner were involved in a shooting in a bar where they killed a guy. And one of the things that Tippett was known for, telling other police officers, be careful, be careful, be careful. But look at his behavior when he makes the stop on Oswald. Was he careful? Did he handle the potential that this guy was an armed killer? Like most nine out of 99 out of a thousand, out of a hundred Police officers would handle it, get out of the car, be ready for a problem. He sits in there and talks through the vent window. He's got the door locked, the window up, so Oswald can't get in, into the car for the ride that he thought he was going to get that day. And so basically, Tippett was reacting to bad information or bad answers from Oswald. He's not going to give Oswald a ride at this point, gets out of the car, and that was his death warrant right there. So, look, you construct hypotheses. It goes back to what Bugliosi said. We have to extrapolate from the little that we do know. And so there's going to be all kinds of theories. Chances are we'll never know what the actual reasons why things happen that way, but did Oswald kill him? Too many witnesses at the scene. What were the kind of more confusing or un I guess explainable parts about Tippett when you were looking into Tippett? Well, the more explainable parts of it? No, the unexplainable. The stuff that's like because Tippett gets mentioned as a red herring in the case, kind of like he can be a, a bit of a sidetrack or distraction, but you know, you look at, I mean, everything in the assassination, really, depending on where you put your niche um, focus in, everything is just, it's connected like cobwebs to everything. So you really got to examine and find an area and really stick with it. But when it comes to Tippett, that was my first interest into the case, was trying to figure out why this, nobody even talks about this cop that was killed the same day as Kennedy um, by the same person, allegedly. So when you really start examining Tippett through your focus, did you find anything that you were like, this doesn't really need to prove a point, doesn't do anything, I just don't know what to do with this, let me toss it off to the side? I got to tell you, the thing that, that just drove me absolutely crazy, 
about this tippet killing was that bent window. I, I I mean, it's weird. It's definitely like crooked stuff, it seems like. I'm like, I don't know anybody that would stop anybody. And it's that little push-out window where you have to really You don't even try. have those. They're not even in the cars anymore. You don't even see them anymore. But this is how he conducts a an interview with a potential assassin. So I it just I, I tell you, I when I as I kept going over it, I, there was a period of time when I was working on this chapter. God, it must have been about a two-week period. I didn't think about anything else with that vent window for two weeks straight. It just didn't fit. And then when I talked to police officers about it, they said, you know, I kind of approached it. When I talked to them, I didn't tell them this was the Kennedy assassination. I didn't mention Tippett's name. And I didn't mention Oswald's name when I talked to the police officers. I just told them a scenario. Unnamed police officer, unnamed killer, didn't give me any background on the events. But I asked him, would you guys conduct an interview in this, this kind of way? Would you pull up to somebody under these kind of circumstances and make that kind of stop? One guy said, the guy had to be nuts. Another guy, police officer, said, when he did that, he signed his own death warrant. That was their response. Their response was basically, in some way, shape, or form, he was involved in something he shouldn't have been involved in. He, he, was, he was tarnished. He was involved in something that wasn't above board. And so basically, they all, every one of them had the same reaction. And they were all stumped by this kind of stuff. These are professional individuals who had been out. And one guy I talked to had been over in uh, Los Angeles for over 30 years, a patrol officer. As a matter of fact, at one point in his career, uh, he was guarding uh, Sirhan Sirhan in the uh, downtown sheriff's office. And um, when I talked to him about this, he said, there was something this guy was involved in that he shouldn't have been involved in for sure. And um, nobody had any sympathy, understanding, or you might say support for this kind of stuff. It was against everything that a police officer would be trained to do in dealing with a dangerous situation such as the one that was confronting Tippett. Why? Why would he do it that way? But if he knew Oswald, if there's some kind of connection here where he was supposed to pick Oswald up and Oswald knew that, that would give him that sense of familiarity that, I, well, you know, I can talk to him through the vent window. I'm not sure what went on. Let me check it out, but I'll talk to him through the vent window. He didn't feel threatened until. He got the answers that he got, which we will never know. We don't know what he asked, and we don't know what Oswald responded. But what we do know is that whatever Oswald said made Tippett get out of the car. When Tippett got out of the car, that action made Oswald kill Tippett. That's that's the best that we're going to be able to do. Why do you think the HSCA talked more about Tippett than probably the Warren Commission did. Say, say that again for me. Why do you think the HSCA looked into the Tippett shooting a little bit more than the Warren Commission did? The uh, the FBI? The HSCA. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I was very surprised by the fact that the Warren Commission didn't go into this more in depth. But, you know, the problem was the Warren Commission had it nicely wrapped up. One shooter, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, a heroic police officer, why dig any deeper? That they, they weren't into, you know, look, the whole history of the Warren Commission is simply this. Wherever there may be something that's conspiratorial, don't touch it, drop it. But the HR, HSCA was looking for conspiracies. They were looking beyond the idea that, you know, this guy was just a uh, local police officer, a heroic individual. 
they they were sensing that there were other reasons behind this killing by Oswald. And so they went into it in greater detail. But the Warren Commission, that's the history of the Warren Commission and everything. Look, Jack Ruby's at Parkland Hospital. What did the Warren Commission say? Oh, he wasn't there. Who, who, whose word do we take for that? Jack Ruby. You know, and, and, and you know, uh, even when he was at the uh, police station, when he showed up at the police station, and all these reporters saw him there at various times. And Ruby claimed, no, 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 I didn't get there till uh, late at night. Whose word did the Warren Commission take over like 15, 20 reporters? Jack Ruby. Oh, no, no, no. The, all those reporters were wrong. Every time you looked at something that was done by the Warren Commission, anywhere there was a potential conspiracy, they dropped it. The House Select Committee on Assassinations didn't do that. The Warren Commission didn't even consider the potential of organized crime in the assassination. Definitely the HSCA did. Okay. They looked at all kinds of conspiracies, the potential that anti Castro Cubans killed them, Castro killed them, Russia killed them. So they were involved in, in, in looking at all of these in detail. To, that, to their credit, they did do that. So the answer with the Warren Commission is quite simple it led to a conspiracy. Drop it. It's such a shame they did that, too. You got to think how easily this could have been solved if they actually just would have tried to solve it. Well, you know, look, as, as, they, as they came out the conclusion and they pointed more to the mafia than anywhere else, the HSCA. That was only going to happen, though. You had Blakey in charge of it. I mean, his whole background is like organized crime. It's like... You know, you can't really blame it for coming out to that conclusion, but at least it opened up the door for research to be done and an ongoing discussion that's been lasting 60 years to, you know, be able to be had in some instances, I should say. At least he was able to deliver a conspiracy outcome. Yeah. Even though everyone forgets about the HSCA, I'm like, look, give them some credit where it's due. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Well, Going back to it, we, we wind up right back where we were with Buyosi's statement. And even, you know, about, you know, we've got to extrapolate from the little that we do know. And so that's where we're going to remain. And then each, you know, these hypotheses come out. I, I laid out one for you today. And it's up to people who uh, go in there and tear it apart. You know, when I was when I was going for my doing my doctoral dissertation, I had to do a defense of my uh, dissertation. And I went into a room with three PhDs and they spent two hours attempting to tear me apart. I mean, I was so upset by the process. The next day I called in sick from work. I couldn't go to work. But that's what you need to do. People have to go in, examine these hypotheses. And let's see what works. What can we get out of our attempts to extrapolate from the little that we do know? But clearly, there was a problem with Tippett and Oswald that indicates some kind of conspiratorial aspect to the murder of J.D. Tippett, period. Whether we'll ever get to the bottom of what the nature of that conspiracy is, is another story. Is there a place where people can find any of your links, Mr. Keller? Yeah, actually, I have a, a link. Um, the John F. Kennedy Political Science Assassination Study dot com. That's a mouthful. It sure is. John F. Kennedy. Political Science Assassination Study.com. And of course, all of this is in the book. He was expendable. I've got a detailed chapter on Ruby, detailed chapter on um, the Tippett killing. And I mentioned to you last time well over 1,600 endnotes, one of which I just gave you today on the FBI report. 
Okay. And I would I would advise people go take a look at that FBI report. I mean, when you study that thing, um you're going to say to yourself, how do they list all these police officers that they're 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 checking on the day of the assassination? All these police cars that they're checking, and they don't even mention Tippett or his car? That's incredible. What's behind that? I mean, and, you know, this satisfied the Warren Commission. They were very happy. You know, uh, nobody drove by the rooming house that day. Well, I don't know whether the Warren Commission read the report, but they left out uh, uh, they left out Tippett and they left out his car. So what was the point of that? We know what the point is. Conspiracy, Warren Commission, bury it. That's what they, they did with everything. Well, Mr. Keller, I'm going to link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you again. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.